The nice thing about AMSA, besides the fact that the microphone makes me sound incredibly loud, is, uh, is that we're a family. And there's nothing that AMSA can do together as an individual. And although I hold the title of the national president, and I've taken a year off from my clinical duties to live and work in Washington, D.C., I certainly don't do any of this alone. So I actually am proud to welcome up to stage with me Brian Hurley, the AMSA national vice president, a fourth year student at the USC Keck School. So if you guys could uh, welcome Brian. And Brian said, hey everybody, what's up AMSA? <laughs> Woo! Woo! We had like two pots of coffee in our hotel room this morning, so understand what's going on up here. Um, but there's a lot of things to talk about in medicine, and there's a lot of things I can say about AMSA, but I think before we delve into the history and a lot of the programming and kind of why AMSA exists, let's ask ourselves why we're here. And if you notice, we're in California. We're here because a billion people in the world subsist on less than a dollar a day. Natural disasters like the tsunami in Southeast Asia, and Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, which ravaged the Gulf Coast. We're also, we also have an unrelenting HIV and AIDS epidemic with 44 million cases of HIV worldwide, as well as a growing obesity epidemic. And Brian, 47 million Americans cannot go and see a physician regularly because they don't have health insurance. And Despite all the rhetoric on TV and all the presidential candidates, uh, healthcare reform looks, looks much like this uh, groundhog or, um, I'm not sure what that is, but it looks a, it's a bot looks a lot like healthcare reform in the United States right now. Uh, and a broken healthcare system where we're facing not just physician shortages, but nursing shortages. We have overcrowded emergency rooms as well. And it doesn't help that society is increasingly seeing medicine as a business rather than a steward of health. That's true, like, you know, students and physicians alike are overworked, crushed by mounting student debt, have to study things like anatomy, <laughs> patient confidentiality. Wait till you guys have to sit through your HIPAA presentations when you start your clinical work. We have to learn things like physical diagnosis skills, <laughs> test taking, I know I saw Kaplan here, they're probably not too proud to see that, but that's what it looked like for me in many days. And uh, the occasional, the occasional evil professor, and Brian, I'm sure you didn't have any of these professors at USC. I, I certainly have not, Mike, no. But it's in this context that we have AMSA, a fully independent medical student association dedicated to true patient advocacy, to student well-being, and to making the world a better place. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, Mike. Absolutely not, Brian. I think we should rewind back to the 1950s when medical students called on the AMA to recognize their growing force in healthcare. And that's all the founding of SAMA, the student AMA. You can see here at University of Michigan student Warren Mullen being sworn in as the first SAMA president. Uh, it also saw the founding of our journal, the Journal of the Student AMA. Although my uh, advertising policy certainly left some room for, for questions. And Brian, as the Vice President, I know that you're aware that we have corrected those problems. And the journal is now called The New Physician, an award-winning magazine that all AMSA members receive today. But things were going to be a little rocky, Brian, in the 1960s. You know, Mike, why don't you tell us what happened? I would love to. So in the 1960s, SAMA members certainly weren't mainstream in the AMA. Particularly divisive for the students was the AMA's silence on the Vietnam War their silence on issues of civil rights, and then their active opposition of the Medicare and Medicaid Act, arguably the most successful healthcare reform we've seen in the 20th century, covering America's vulnerable populations. So it looked like SAMA members felt the need to make some noise. And in 1968, SAMA jumped ship, announcing to the AMA House of Delegates that SAMA is now a completely independent student association. Right, it looks like the delegates were a little less than happy to hear the other news. No, in fact, they were not. But since that day, AMSA would be truly independent, dedicated to true patient advocacy, student well-being, and changing medical education for the better, particularly in the arena of diversity in the physician workforce. A few years later, we had our first woman president, and we arranged a letter from AMSA, for, from SAMA to AMSA. You know, Brian, those weren't the only changes going on in AMSA at the time. We 
We moved from our hometown, Chi Town. Anybody from Chicago here? Woo! Yes! <laughs> Some represents from Pritzker over there. Um, to our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. It also saw the addition of a second full time student, our legislative affairs director. Hey, Mike. Brian! Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh! What about me? Brian, who's this guy in the back? Mike, that, that's uh, Flavio, our Jack Rutledge fellow. Yeah, really, Mike. Uh, you're the national president. You, uh, you work with this guy full time in the national office. Anyway, also, uh, in the 1980s, there was a growing AIDS epidemic, which is a health issue of our generation. And sadly, the disease took one of our own, an uh, inspirational president named Jack Rutledge. We've since named a full-time fellowship in his honor, the Jack Rutledge Fellowship. Adding to opportunity and voices for students, um, in a way, we saw tragedy strike AMSA once again on September 11th, 2001, when Paul Ambrose, our 10th Legislative Affairs Director, passed away when his plane crashed into the Pentagon. And since then, AMSA has named all of our legislative affairs institutes after him to recognize his role in health policy over the years. Most recently, three years ago, we added our Global AIDS fellow, a student who takes the year off, who actually just got word last night, uh, he got back from Tanzania and had to be uh, admitted to the hospital for malaria. Uh, but he's taking the year off working on HIV AIDS, both domestically uh, and globally. And our fifth student who takes the year off with us and lives and works with me, Paige Hatch, our director of student programming, a job, Ryan, I think you may know a little something about. In fact, I do. was the director of student programming last year, Mike. Excellent. So the question is, with all these students taking the years off, and being an independent organization of students, what is it that we've done, and what is it that we're seeking to do here, as medical students, as free medical students, as residents, as physicians? Well, these leaders, and other leaders, Brian, yes. have certainly, uh, am I, I'm probably taking your no, I'm under here. That's on a roll. <laughs> anyway, it certainly left our mark on uh, medicine over the years. So, we, AMSA was instrumental in structuring the HEAL deal, which was the first student loan program that brought relief from excessively high interest rates. We were also responsible for changing the National Residency Match Program that changes the program to favor candidates' choices as opposed to the program's choices. We also, speaking of uh, the match, Mike, AMS has been responsible for bringing a number of couples together over the years with a higher success rate than, I don't know, J8, perhaps. <laughs> hey, Mike, isn't that you proposing to a, uh, a, a fellow board member at our convention this past year? Yeah, Brian, it is, and I, I think you were there, so you should remember it. <laughs> <clears throat> but that wasn't the only thing that AMS has been up to. Uh, AMSO was certainly pivotal in the founding of the National Service Corps in the late 1960s. This is a scholarship program and a loan repayment program for physicians and dentists and other primary care providers who choose to practice in areas of medical need once they're done with their training. Probably one of our more successful initiatives was residency work hours. In uh, uh, 2004, AMSA filed an OSHA petition along with Public Citizen asking and forcing the ACG to need to limit the work hours of residents. Our understanding was that if you're too tired to drive home from the hospital, probably too tired to operate on a patient in the hospital. Also, our Farm Free campaign, which is coming up, our National Farm Free Week, it's an effort for medical students to stand up and say that the integrity of our profession is certainly not for sale, and definitely not for the cost of a few pens and a few clipboards. And it makes me hungry for a little bit of Prozac right now, right? <laughs> You know, Mike, we're also joined by the legacy of the AMSA Foundation. This is a picture of AMSA Foundation students and program leaders meeting with former Surgeon General David Satcher. Our AMSA Foundation works on a number of programs related to complementary and alternative medicine, end of life care, and cultural competency. You know, Brian, throughout all these years, AMSA has certainly grown quite a bit as well. Spanning over 10 regions, we have medical chapters at all osteopathic and allopathic medical schools. We have over 68,000 members contributing over a million hours of community service every year. Not only that, as the only medical organization that charters pre-med chapters, we have over 200 chapters now and over 5,000 pre-med members. You know, enough of this bureaucracy, Mike. <laughs> what do AMSA members really do? Well, we have the heart and soul of AMSA. AMSA's eight action committees related to topics on global health, health policy, medical education, and others. We also have a number of interest groups on topics related yep. to 
military medicine, geriatrics, primary care, mental health.